Okay, so now we're going to look at um, sort of a survey of representative organisms from different phyla that represent sort of evolutionary stages towards chordates and humans. So if we look at the periphera, like this, I'm going to have to uh, stop and recalibrate. Okay, periphera, which we commonly call the sponges. Sponges are animals, but they're very simple, primitive animals. Um, if we draw a picture of a sponge, in fact, I have here, I'll, I'll flip to YouTube, or to um, one of my other tabs here, not that one, for germ layers. So this picture right here I thought was pretty good. Let's see if we can go to it. Um, well, I went to it, but it's... It's not working. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's... Okay. So what we can see here is a picture of a, of a sponge, just what it, it's sort of a macroscopic picture of what it looks like, but it's quite small. And so um, this orangey-brown colored outer skin is um, uh, endoderm, right? Or endoderm tissue. And uh, it's oh, getting started. Don't want to get started. It's um, got a, an, um, sorry, did I say endo? Ecto, ectoderm on the outside, obviously. And then there's an endoderm tissue sort of, kind of, but, but not really. The, the thing about these particular sponges is we don't really have much differentiation in the cells. So it's hard to find like any endoderm inside. And there's, the cells seem to just form a, a single kind of wall. Right, and the single wall that separates you from the inside and the outside. So it's almost more like a like a membrane in a sense, right? And then what happens is there are these little pores, little holes between the cells. You can see them where the, where the arrows are, uh, right here, and here, and here. And these pores allow water to be sucked into this cavity in the middle. And of course, the water carries with it microscopic organisms and things that are organic matter algae and, and per, uh, protozoans and things that the, the uh, sponge can break down and use for nutrients. And then the water enters through the pores and then it just kind of is pushed upwards and out this way. You can see it says water flow there, out through this top part, this opening in the top, which is sort of connected, uh, connected to this cavity inside. You would want to call it a mouth but not really, because mostly stuff is coming out there. So it's actually more akin to an anus in a sense, because the water is being sucked in through the tiny pores. You can see the pores here on the outside. So that's kind of the structure. So if we were to draw a picture of this, um, go back to our little note here. All we find is they have uh, layers of cells. Maybe uh, we'll draw it as a couple layers here like this. And then maybe we can use different colors. There'll be this sort of little space here. And uh, more cells. And so we'll just draw a couple of representative little spaces or pores. Okay, and this goes around like this. So there's really no endo or ectoderm as such, right? This outer part here, it's just kind of like the a single layer of tissue. Very little cell differentiation. And then at the top, we have this sort of there's cilia here and cells that form this opening at the top. Oh, I should have put another pore down here. Let's just draw one more just for fun. So basically, the way this structure works is that water is sort of enters into the middle through the pore into this body cavity that's created by this circular shaped group of cells. So water siphons, it's like a little siphon. Water siphons in, but it brings with it the nutrients that are needed. Remember, if you're living in the ocean, the ocean water is full of dissolved bits of things. It's full of uh, algae and protozoa and microscopic creatures. 
and all kinds of organic matter, mo molecules of all kinds, right? It's like a soup of molecules. And so then the, the water is then forced up and outwards this way through the top. You'll see stuff come squirting out at the top. And that's really it for the sponge. Um, Okay, and they have, the reason they're called a sponge, or the reason we use them as sponges is because they have all these little holes and pores in them. Now, we can make a sponge to wash our dishes by, you know, we get a sponge, a little piece of foam, and we put all these holes in it. And so these holes work their way in and out of the sponge. And some of the holes are very big and some of them are quite small. And, and even the weave of the fabric or whatever it is. And so when you squeeze it, Underwater, you know, it sucks water in. It soaks up water, right? And then when you squeeze it, the water comes out. Well, these artificial sponges that we make are modeled after what used to be used as a sponge was an actual sponge. You can actually get real live sponges, like the loofah. A loofah sponge is actually a, a, an animal. It comes from a live creature. It's dried out, but then it, you can use it in the shower to wash. It's kind of got a little bit of abrasiveness to it. All right, um, and so this idea of the sponge nature that soaks water in through the pores and out. Um, there, there's something we like to keep track of is what we call body symmetry. Symmetry means um, if you cut the body along a certain plane, you get one side similar to another. So I'll give you an example. If you take a human being and you slice us sort of right down the middle, you get two pieces that are very similar to each other. One arm on one side, one arm on the other. One leg on one side. There are slight differences. For instance, your spleen will be on this side, won't be on the other side. So we're not completely 100% symmetrical, but we are pretty much in terms of our general body type. And so the different ways you can slice things refer to the kind of symmetries that you can get. And so body symmetry is another way of, of classifying. So sponges have little to no symmetry. Um, if you look at the picture of them, you can pretty much slice them any way you want and you get the same result. Right? Like you think about a ball. A ball doesn't really have, I mean it has symmetry. You can slice it this way, but you could also slice it this way or this way or this way or this way. And there's no real one way better. One way doesn't give you something the other ways don't. See, humans, if you slice them this way, you get something very different on the top than you do on the bottom. The whole head thing, right? So we don't have a symmetry that way. We have the line this way creates a different picture or a different division than this way. And so uh, not quite the same. Uh, so with, with sponges, we basically say that sponges have little symmetry in their body symmetry. Um, they have a uh, very basic cell specialization. Whoops, I put very cell basic. Hang on. Very basic cell specialization. Or, or uh, differentiation, right? Same thing. There's some some of the cells do have slightly different functions. Like, for instance, the, the cells surrounding the pores are probably a little bit different than the cells at that, that opening at the top and so on. But, but not much. Not so much that we start to see specific uh, tissues or germ layers. So, essentially, um, essentially, we basically only have uh, one germ layer. It's not really even a germ layer because if you only have one, why distinguish it from the others? So I'll put a question mark there, right? The only, the only reason you would start talking about germ layers is if you had different ones. It's all the same sort of, of um, layer. Uh, the other thing about sponges is they don't move. So motile means you can move. Sessile means you don't move. They grow attached to something. So they're quite primitive in terms of their body structure. 
Now, what we'll do is as we move into the next groups, we'll start to see changes in things like body symmetry and changes in germ layers and changes, obviously, in, in their motion and so on. So if we go up to the next group, sort of, and when I say the next, I mean I've, I've selected these phyla as representative of things. It doesn't mean that there's a direct evolutionary link between them all. It's just showing you sort of, you know, the, the different stages at which evolution could occur. I'm not drawing a, a precise line, we're just looking at representative examples. So if you look at Nidaria, right, do you remember what they are? That's the jellyfish, Nidarians, uh, anemones, and so on. They have two basic shapes, to this group. They have what's called the polyp shape. And the polyp shape usually involves some kind of structure that comes up and has sort of like little tentacly arms or something like this, and then it sits on a base, attached to a base. Or they have something called the, the medusa structure, which is free-floating. And that's the sort of jellyfish sort of look, where you've got this body and then lots of dangly tentacles here that hang behind. Uh, the polyps can move. They can sort of bend and twist and roll and move from place to place. They're not completely sessile, but they tend to like to anchor their bottoms to something solid. And you'll see them. So like the sea anemone, right? Um, let me show you. Let's get some pictures. Pictures are worth a thousand words. So let's go up here and Google uh, a sea anemone. Whoops, sea anemone images. And we can see what they look like. They have this polypy form. Here's a good one right here. You can see the stalk, the dark stalk, and all these tentacles up above. And so if you look at their body, you can imagine how their body's set up. Inside the stalk, they have a cavity, which is kind of like their body cavity. And then the tentacles are up there, and the tentacles are, are, are creating currents of water that pull in things that float by. So they're pulling in nutrients or microorganisms, or in some cases, they actually pull in fish and large things, and they go into the middle of the anemone. Many of these things have stinging cells to paralyze animals, small animals, and when they get pulled into the cavity, digestive juices can break them down and use them. So it doesn't have to be microscopic food. So that's what the polyp form looks like. Um, another well, let me see. Yeah, I think that's the best. There you can see one here. See how the stalk is attached to some rock or some something in the ocean. Uh, but it can move. It can, it can break loose and it can sort of tumble and roll and, and, uh, and get it moved from one place to another if it wants to. Uh, the medusa, let's go jellyfish. And we can see the difference here. The medusa. These are. So there's a good example there. It's got this top. It looks like an umbrella. And what it can do is it can pulsate that umbrella and use it to sort of push itself through the water, right? So as it pulsates the the the, uh, the umbrella, it creates like a little a little uh, pressure that pushes it. And so when they swim, they they go in jerky motions, and the tentacles dangle behind. Um, they feed similarly. The tentacles are often have stinging cells, and things get trapped in the tentacles. Jellyfish do prey on other things, animals, um, and when they get trapped in the in there, the the jellyfish then can sort of draw the nutrients up into the medusa, which is where the where the the what we call the the gastrovascular cavity, the the place inside where digestion would occur. Okay, so that's the two different types. Uh, this one is much more motile, though. Eh? It swims much more, sort of, doesn't just kind of roll around like the, like the polyp version. This one can really move. Um, and there's many different types of jellyfish, and they have different styles of medusa and different tentacles and so on. Okay, so if we were to look at their, their germ layers, what's important is that they have two germ layers two very specific germ layers. So, two of them. They have ectoderm and endoderm. But they don't have 
any mesoderm developed. And so if you think about what mesoderm does, it usually develops into muscle tissue and bone structure, right? Cardiovascular system and things like that. They don't have much of that. They don't have bones. They don't, and they don't really have muscles as such either. Uh, but they do have nerves, which is interesting because nerves develop from different tissues, right? They develop from uh, endoderm mostly. And so, oh, sorry, no. Well, I guess it depends. It depends on that whole blastulation process and gastrulation process, right? Because the mesoderm actually develops from the other tissues, but don't worry about that. They don't have muscles, but they do have an, a very primitive nervous system. Uh, if we look at the picture of a typical polyp style, what we would see is that the ectoderm would line the outside of the polyp, right? And then I'll sort of go up into one of the tentacles only. This is kind of a close-up. So the rest of the tentacles they're there, but we're not drawing them, right? And then you have this, um, whatever, so the rest of the tentacles. And then inside, there's another layer of the endoderm, which forms this cavity. And the endoderm might actually even extend up into tentacles slightly, like this. So it would kind of... So there's the endoderm inside, and the ectoderm on the outside. Right? Two specific germ layers. But it's still the same basic body plan as the coral. It's a cavity inside, but now we have two different layers of cells. Um, if I look at some, I think I have a picture of this as well to show you. This was the polyp one, but uh, let me find, here we go, Medaria. Here's a picture. You can kind of see it's similar to what I drew. And then what you have is this gastrovascular cavity. It's called gastrovascular because it serves two functions. It, gastro means stomach, right? So this is where things go to get digested. And there's enzymes secreted by the cells. The endoderm cells would secrete enzymes to digest food. But also, um, it serves the purpose of the circulatory system too because when you're, you don't need to circulate. If you look at the body plan, the fluid inside that yellowish area on both, in both of them is pretty much touching all the cells. And so whatever nutrients are needed are floating freely all around the inside of that cavity. They're going to be able to get to virtually all the cells without too much need of blood vessels and heart and all that. And of course, they don't have that because they don't have mesoderm tissue. So that's the, uh, the polyp here, this one. We'll draw another picture of the medusa. You can kind of see it's sort of the same thing, right? If we were to draw a simplified version of the medusa, we would see that it has ectoderm cells all around the outside, right? And again, we can draw maybe one or two of the tentacles up close just to see what it would look like. Right here, we'll draw another one over here. Here's a tentacle going this way. Right? And there'll be more tentacles, but we're not drawing them all. And then inside, you can see that there's sort of a, these are cells forming this endoderm. And they sort of dip down into there. And kind of like this, and up like that, and something like that. And of course, there's an opening here, right? This would be like, like the way, there has to be an opening. Same here, there's an opening in the top, or under the, 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 the medulla, in order for things to get in, right? The, the, the nutrients to go into this, this area. So we have what's called the gastrovascular cavity, which serves the purpose of both digestion and circulation of nutrients. That's the space that's inside here. Remember how we talked about plants having really no space? They're pretty much solid cells all through their structures. And animals, of course, have these cavities, these body cavities, which is what makes them very different, formed by this tissue specialization and the folding and, and indenting of the, of the, uh, the, the zygote as it develops and grows, right? The blastula and all of that. Okay, so basically two germ layers, an inside and an outside, and the ability to, um, well, cells that are more specialized for digestion and for 
absorbing nutrients. Okay. Um, the symmetry of these, if you look in the handout, uh, did I mention the symmetry? Yeah, I did. They have radial symmetry there, you see? Radial symmetry means you can take their bodies, um, so like a jellyfish, right? If you look at it from the top, you can cut it in pie shapes radially and get very similar pieces. But of course, you can't cut it this way. If you cut a jellyfish through this way, you get pieces that are not the same, right? So this is called radial because the symmetry lines all touch and they all come out from the middle. So we call this radial symmetry. Another animal that has radial symmetry, uh, it's not part of this phylum, it's part of echinodermata, is the starfish, right? You can draw radial lines through a starfish. It's the same kind of idea. That says symmetry. Just my finger went awry. Radial symmetry. So whereas the uh, sponges had virtually no real symmetry at all, we now have symmetry developing. Um, symmetry is not an, a, a thing functionally or physiologically that much, but it's a way to classify, right? It's just a way of describing their bodies. Okay, if we move on, uh, oh, you'll notice in the, in, the, in the sheet there, I talked about the fact that this phylum also has the ability to sting, stinging cells. And of course, that's, that's a job, right? So that's a specialized kind of cell. In order to sting something and have toxin, you have to be specialized. So there is significant cell specialization here. Uh, I don't know if we wrote that. Yeah, well here, two germ layers. So when we say there's two germ layers, what we're basically saying is there is now a obvious cell differentiation or specialization into the two layers. Very obvious. Okay. So it's a step forward from the periphery, from the sponge, right? It's a little more complex. It doesn't necessarily mean that we can draw direct lines from a particular sponge to a particular jellyfish. That's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, I'm just trying to show you how this is later on. It's like sampling, right? Different samples. Okay, let's go to the next group then, which is Platyhelminthes. Whoops, L, sorry, couldn't spell it right. Platyhelminthes. That's an I and that's an E. Platyhelminthes. Okay. And this is what we call flatworms. Flatworms. Um, this is a, a, a new development of symmetry in these bodies. Let me just show you some pictures first. We'll, we'll look at flatworms. If I just Google flatworms, we should get all kinds of different pictures. And I go to images. Uh, ignore my drawing there. I'll have to remember to erase that. I can erase that from here, I think. Yeah. Okay, so I'll erase those and then I'll grab my, my pen again in case I want to circle anything. Here are a whole bunch of um, different flatworms. The most common flatworm that we use as an example in biology is the second one here, this one right here, the, the planarian worm. So maybe we'll use him as our sort of, our sort of go-to. Um, but they have all different sort of shapes and sizes, but they are all kind of flat. Their bodies are kind of like squash. So they're like little ribbony shapes. They're not nice and round and plump like an earthworm would be, right? They're very different. And of course, they are not uh, as advanced as earthworms. They're not segmented. They're just a simple body plan, but they're kind of a step up from the jellyfish. So let's look at uh, flatworm. Let's look at the planarian worm as an example. So planarian, whoops, YouTube, no, planarian, flatworm, and we'll go to uh, images here. So there you can see them. This is probably the best picture right there, right? You can see that it has... If you straightened them out, you could draw a line right down the middle 
and separate them into two nice halves. That's called bilateral symmetry, two halves, bilateral. So they have bilateral symmetry. I could draw a line right down the middle. Now, he's curved, so I'd have to curve my line. But if you straightened him out, two, and you'll notice they both have, these are little eye spots that are sensitive to light. They're not fully functional eyes like ours. They're just specialized cells that are sensitive to light. So the planarian can't see like we do, but it can sense dark and light areas, right? It can, it's kind of like if you close your eyes, when you look towards lights, it's redder. But when you look away, it's darker. You get that little bit of difference, eh? Because of your eyelid being so thin. So they can sort of sense that kind of difference. So they can go towards the light or away from the light. Okay, let's look at their body plan. Uh, let's go planarian body plan. Uh, maybe if I put germ layers, it might give me what we want. Let's try that. Okay. Well, if you look at this first picture, you can see they've got a, a cross section. That's actually a good picture. Maybe we'll look at that. If you look at it, you can see that in the cross section, uh, let me erase what I've written on there so it doesn't get in our way. Now, let me pick uh, maybe a color that'll stand out like green. So you can see that the, 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 there's a cavity inside. This, this weird black gray area, that's the body cavity, right? And it, and it basically is this little tube in the middle that's open. But, it, but it's not just a circular tube. It's kind of skewing all through. Um, and that's because it also serves as a as a bit of a circulatory system as well, right? But you can see here three distinct layers of tissue. First time we've seen that. There's now a mesoderm in this flatworm. That means if it has mesoderm, it has more specialization, which basically means it can form more complex structures, muscle. It definitely has muscle tissue because it can wiggle and move its body using muscle contraction, right? Um, and that's, that's fairly, uh, fairly new. Certainly the sponges couldn't do that. And the, um, the nadarians, the jellyfish, they kind of do it in a way without muscle. They have, there's nerve tissue and there's contractile tissue in their bodies, but it's not quite the same as muscle. Yeah. Yeah, this thing sort of undulates and wiggles like, like you know, when you put your hand out the window in the car really fast. It undulates its body and swims in that sort of a manner, kind of, because it's flat on top, right? So sideways motion doesn't work, but it can go up and down and undulate. So if we were to draw this picture, right, we could draw the three tissues. You can see that the endoderm is that little yellow part. That's what's forming the digestive cavity, which is what the endoderm prim primarily does. You've got the, the ectoderm forming the outer skin and the mesoderm, the red section, which would be forming the uh, muscular structures in order to man maneuver that body. No skeleton, though. No real skeleton to speak of. Nothing like that. Just muscular contractile tissue that can make this thing a little more mobile. So it's much more motile. Uh, where did I go? Way down here. Oh, how did that happen? Somehow, I'm stuck in the middle. I'm going to erase this. I don't know how this thing jumped. It must have jumped up a page on me. Go back down here. This is part of the, uh, the nadarians, right? This is part of the jellyfish. So let me go to the bottom here. Extend my page. There's where our line should be. And let's go. I'll write platy helminths these again here. Okay, flatworms. So uh, if we draw a picture of the planarian, the planarian is an example of a flatworm. It's a good example. So it's called the planarian worm. And uh, essentially the planarian has sort of a arrow-shaped head. And then it has a long sort of body. Now what we're going to do is like in the book, we're going to do a cross section of the body. So I'll I'll draw a little circle, um, a little arrow-shaped head, a little fat section here, and so it's like we're cutting off part to see inside, right? So what we see in here is the, uh, the gastrointestinal tissue. 
So you see that it has, oh, it also has these little eye spots, right? And it has, uh, let's go a green, I guess, uh, this tract inside. I'm just going to color it all sort of green. And it's, it's all wiggly and woggly because it's, it's all stretched out so that it, it has close contact with all the cells, right? The, the ectoderm can't be too far away from the endoderm because as the nutrients are absorbed, they have to pass from cell to cell, diffusion, right? In such a way that all the cells can have access to it. And so we'll draw a little circle right here in the middle. There, there's the opening of that passage, that complex passageway. And then in the middle, we have in here the a mesoderm. So we have the ectoderm in black. In green, we have the endoderm, which is the gastrointestinal sort of tract. And then we have the mesoderm. You can't really see the mesoderm uh, unless you cut it in half, because it's, it's sandwiched in between the ecto and endoderm, right? It's, it's internally sandwiched. Okay, so the flatworms have uh, three germ layers. The first time we've seen that. So three germ layers basically is the same as saying much more cell specialization. Cells that are doing far more variety of jobs. Uh, you get muscle structures that we haven't seen before, and that obviously means that the animal is far more able to move. So we go from a sponge, which can't move at all, and we start to see how animals are able to get around. Getting around is a critical part of being an animal, because you've got to be able to catch food. If you're a coral, or not a coral, sorry, a sponge, you're um, relying on food to sort of float by, and you suck it in. But if you can move, then you can go to the food, and that's a huge developmental um, Thing. The other thing that happens with these guys, which is interesting, that we see here, is that they can regenerate body parts, which is very cool. In other words, if you take a planarian worm, and I remember doing this in biology class in university, and you take a scalpel, a sharp blade, and you cut it right here, whoosh, cut its head off, what will happen is that head will continue to live and it'll start to grow a whole new little tail. And the tail will continue to live and start to grow a whole new little head. And you'll end up with two, just by simply slicing it in half. Right? If you slice it the other way, if you slice the worm um, this way, down the middle, then the two halves will grow into two completely new worms on either side. What's really weird is you could take a worm and slice only part way into its head, and we did this as well, and what you get is if you only slice in part way, it'll just grow two heads, and you'll get a two-headed worm. Yeah, it's very weird. And of course, this ability is found in these smaller, simpler organisms. Um, it's also found in some higher organisms, even some vertebrates. We can't, they can't regenerate to the same extent, but lizards can regrow a tail if it falls off sometimes and things like that. And scientists are studying this idea of regenerating limbs because it would be cool if someone was in a tragic accident and lost a limb. It'd be kind of cool if we had a way to grow a new one medically. So if we can study this and learn how it works. Part of the problem is, is it seems to work well with simple organisms. The more complex the organisms, the harder it is to regenerate. Like the lizard only regenerates a tail. Can't regenerate its heart and its lungs and its digestive system and all of that. So we, we lose that. But this is a very simple, easy body plan. And it's the same all over. So regenerating the whole worm is actually pretty easy. So that's kind of cool. And um, obviously, there's uh, I mentioned the symmetry. Uh, if you cut it down the middle... You get two halves, right, the eye spots. So this is what we call bilateral symmetry. And what this means is it's basically saying when you look at bilateral symmetry, we start to see the, the, the animal body plan concept where one end is a head and one end is a tail. 
didn't really see that in the sponges or the jellyfish. Where's a jellyfish head? Well, the medusa, but I don't know. But now we sort of have this, this bilateral slice down the middle, but we also see this head tail sort of, sort of um, thing that we never saw before. A definite front and a back end, you know what I mean? Okay, we'll do one more, I guess, because we have time. We'll do uh, the next group, which is uh, the annelids, annelida, this, um, the segmented worms. You'll notice too uh, with the um, with the planarian, the, the the idea of the head and tail also uh, is the beginning of where we saw the eye spots and the sensory organs. Sensory organs are also now, instead of being sort of everywhere, sensory cells and organs are being concentrated in the head of the animal. Think about it, the head is basically your sense center. Right? Most of your senses are focused in your head region. Analida, segmented worms. Okay, now here's an interesting body plan. The segmented worm, if you look at a typical earthworm, looks like this. It has a little sort of section here, which is part of its, uh, it's involved in mating. I'll explain that later. Okay. And so the earthworm has definite uh, endoderm tissue, which forms, it has a little sort of a stomach, which is called like a crop or a gizzard. And then it has a, basically it's a long tube, it's a digestive tube. This is the endoderm tissue and comes out the other end like that. It's, it's a narrow tube. And then of course it has the ectoderm in black and then it has mesoderm as well. And it also has uh, muscles, obviously. So there are the three germ layers. But what's interesting about this body is there's a significant change. It also has what we call segments. And so when you look at its body up close, I'll draw this picture again, but I'll draw it differently. Uh, I'll draw it down here. When you look at the body of the worm, it has specific segments. And each segment is almost like a repeat of the other. In other words, as it specializes, each segment sort of learns to specialize and they almost operate almost independently. They, are, they all have their own sort of set of of things. So uh, they all draw their nutrients out of the gut. So the, 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 the earthworm basically eats dirt. And as it eats the dirt, and the dirt goes through its digestive tract, it extracts the nutrients from it. But the earthworm also has a circulatory system. It has blood vessels, a dorsal one that runs along the top and a ventral one that runs along the bottom. It doesn't have hearts as such, but what it has uh, right around here, I'm not going to draw all this because I'll draw it in blue. There's a, there's a blood vessel across the top and the bottom, and right around here there are five little connectors or arches across. And these arches are muscular blood vessels that can pump. So they're a primitive heart, and they pump, right? So we have actual blood vessels. That's something we have not seen. Um, each segment, though, has each segment has a blood vessel running across the top and the bottom. There's a nerve that runs along. I believe in the earthworm, it's a ventral stomach nerve, main sort of nerve, not like us that run down our back. It runs more along their stomach, and then that gives nerve tissue uh, to each segment. So I'm, I'm going to draw this along here like this: the blood vessel, top and bottom. Right, and so it's kind of like it's kind of like a, a circular path where the blood is flowing one way along the top, and then it would join through tiny capillaries or just bathe over, like an open circulatory system that bathes over tissues, depending on the type of worm and all the different options. Uh, and then, of course, there's the digestive tract down the middle. There's even even um, what we call nephridia, which are little tubes. Remember those. These are little tubes that collect waste and empty into the digestive tract. They're like primitive. It's, it's kind of not really like a kidney, but it does the same job as a kidney. It, it absorbs or, or basically extracts waste, nutri waste products and allows these to 
be dumped into the digestive tract and gotten rid of as this as this you know stuff moves through. So now, of course, we're seeing organ you know organ development in its early stages. We're seeing primitive hearts that pump blood. We're seeing a primitive excretory system. We're seeing nerves, actual nerves. Now, the nerves have been around forever, though. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't make that distinction. I drew the nerve here, but even the Nidarians had nerves. Nerves are very, very old. And I guess we're out of time. So uh, we'll just quickly add here that there's bilateral symmetry as well. Bilateral symmetry, which we're going to see that sort of symmetry. That's going to be all the way through. Uh, anything else that I need to oh uh, the nerve is not just a single nerve but what we find is there are little blumps called ganglia ganglia so these are nerve bundles so they're like a primitive brain right they're, they're, they each operate they each sort of control each segment so the earthworm doesn't have a central brain at the top like we do it has little mini brains all the way along so that's interesting um, and the excretory system and so on. But because it's more complicated, it doesn't regenerate like the flatworm does. Okay? And of course, anything else I haven't mentioned is in the summary of the sheet here. We'll call that one done.